Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today's video is inspired by one of our viewers and uh, it's Davil from Australia. Hi Dave. So Dave saw our last video on uh, how to sharpen a tapered reamer and explained to me that he had a whole bunch of straight reamers and he was gonna use that method to uh, custom size them. Uh, they're currently SAE size, he wants to bring them down to metric. And, uh, and so that won't work. So in today's video, we're going to uh, show how to custom size a straight reamer. If you missed the video on how to sharpen a tapered reamer, I'll put a uh, link in the description below. So before you, Molly. <laughs> so before we get going here, I think it's important that we discuss some of the uh, fundamental differences between how the edge on a tapered reamer works compared to a straight reamer. So basically anything that spins to cut, you can imagine it starting out as a circle. And then you're, you're always going to have a tooth face. That's what I've, I've drawn here. Now on a tapered reamer, right from the very cutting edge, immediately there's a clearance angle that begins. On this tapered reamer, you can see that the, the face of the tooth is here and then immediately the cutting angle begins and that's because this taper is designed to cut over the full length to give you a tapered hole. Now a straight reamer is different. With a straight reamer, again, you have a tooth face and eventually you have some clearance, but you also have this little bit right here that remains round. So if you look at this reamer, here's our, our clearance, this bigger area. And if you can see here, right there, that shiny bit, that's actually round. That's part of a circle. There's no clearance there. And that's because you want the edges down at the end to do the cutting and then you want the whole rest of it just to sort of add support and follow along and keep everything uh, from chattering around. So this straight reamer we're working on today happens to have a really, really slow right hand spiral to it. And this, what we're gonna do today, this method will work whether it's uh, got a slight right hand spiral, straight flute, or even a left hand spiral, which I don't have an example to show, but you can imagine it's opposite of this. Um, there's also, other flavors of straight reamers, there's, there's shell reamers, uh, some of them are going to have Morris taper shanks, some of them are going to have round shanks, and they can all be done. It's just going to be slight variances in the setup. Now for this guy we're doing today, uh, I've decided to work between centers. And uh, I could also hold this in a collet at one end, support it with a center at the other end. Uh, I could uh, also put this in a three or four jaw chuck and support it with a, a, a tailstock at this end. It's always important, if at all possible, to support the far end of this so that you don't get chatter or flex of your tool going on. So with the straight reamer, um, they're not perfectly straight and this is a super critical feature here. They're gonna be ever so slightly bigger at the end that does the cutting than they are at the trailing end. And the reason, the reason they're like this, if you exaggerated it in the opposite direction and made it bigger here, knowing that these little lands are round, that thing would just bind up on you and get hot and it would pick up and it would just be a mess. It'd be a disaster. But by having it just slightly bigger at this end than it is at this end, this end rubs a tiny little bit and then the rest of it all kind of clears. And so the, the little bit that's rubbing just a little bit gives us the support we're looking for. And then the clearance uh, behind that basically makes it not jam up or overheat. So to start off with, I've got my table perfectly dialed in zero and I have my motorized work head and my tailstock uh, again, perfectly dialed in zero and pointed at each other down the center line of this table. So anything I put between these centers is going to uh, be perfectly cylindrical and the same diameter the whole way. Now, we just said we don't want that, so what I'm going to do is over this distance, I'm going to have, I'm going to adjust my table until it reads uh, plus a little at this end, and I'm only talking, I, I, I want basically, I want this end about a thou smaller than this end, and that would be uh, approximately 0 0.025 mil. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my test dial on here, I'm going to set my stops to give me give myself this amount of travel and then I'm going to get my dial running from zero to uh, plus 0 0.0125 mils at this end or half a thou. Okay. 
Here we are running zero as I explained. Everything is starting at zero. Now I'm going to adjust my table this way slightly, ever so slightly, just to give me uh, a little bit smaller diameter at the back end of the reamer than we're going to have at the front. I've got it all dialed in now. I'm starting at zero here and we're coming plus half thou at the back end or again that's 0 0.0125 mil approximately. Just gonna put a drive dog on here. Made this in a earlier episode. Maybe I'll put that link there for you too in case you're interested in seeing, seeing that done. Okay, so that's all ready to go. Uh, next thing we're gonna do is get a wheel up there and we're gonna address it and get it running true. So because we're grinding high speed steel here, this is a uh, aluminum oxide wheel. And I've chosen a pretty hard um, bond because we don't have a ton to take off. Uh, prox approximately a 32nd of an inch has to come off. So a 64th per side. So we're not really looking for a cool cutting wheel that can hog lots of material off without generating a lot of heat. I'm more looking for a wheel that will maintain its dress uh, throughout the process. I do have a clearance problem here between my drive dog and my wheel nut. And um, the issue is once I touch off on this and start grinding, I don't ever want to back the table out at all. Um, when I want to measure this, what I want to do is I want to run my wheel off the back of the cutting edges so that it's sitting in here. That'll allow me to measure here and here um, without you know the wheel being in the way or rubbing on anything and uh, this nut won't let me do it. So I have a slightly lower profile nut that'll hopefully give me that tiny little extra bit that I need. Snuggly. Yeah. That nut is not happy to go on there. Plan C, I suppose. I'm gonna go with a bigger diameter wheel. Hopefully that'll give me the clearance I'm looking for. This wheel is still quite fine and it's still pretty hard. It's uh, quite a bit bigger in diameter. So I'm hoping this gives me the clearance I'm looking for. So this is much better. This is perfect. I can come all the way off of my lands where I'm going to be cutting. And uh, I've still got plenty of clearance here between these parts. And so this, this will work fine for us. So I'm getting ready now to dress this wheel, get it running true and make it flat. And uh, again, my hope is that I can do this just once and get through the whole process because if not, then I'm going to be forced to have to come in and touch off again. And that's just a real big pain in the neck. So if possible, I'm going to avoid that. Got my wheel dressed out and I'm just setting up stops here. <clears throat> I want at both ends. I don't want to come this way smoking into my tailstock and I don't want to come too far this way and smoke it into my drive dog. So now I've got to stop at each end and uh, nothing will go wrong. I've already taken a lick off of this and I did forget to tell you guys an important step before you go taking a lick off. You want to note the size of this land, how wide it is, because as you grind this down in diameter, that land is going to get wider and later you're going to have to come back and grind away at this clearance angle to reduce that land back to the size it originally was. So I've taken the minimum skim off of this. It's cleaned up all the way around and from end to end. So the very next thing I'm going to do before I get too far down the road is I'm going to measure it and make sure that it is in fact bigger at the cutting end than it is at the trailing end. And to take this measurement, I'm using my micrometer. It's uh, far more accurate than a dial caliper. And we are in fact uh, about a thou and a half smaller at the trailing end than the leading edge. And I did say we were shooting for a thou, but this is just an example. If you want to get fussier than this, you know, you're welcome to. 
but uh, that half a thou difference from what I was shooting for is not going to make any difference at all in how this thing actually works. Now I'm all cleaned up from end to end and all the way around and, uh, and so I've set a zero on my cross feed hand wheel and um, I took a measurement of where I'm at at my cutting edge. I know where I want to go so I'm going to take just less than half of that amount uh, with this in feed wheel and then uh, we'll look at uh, measuring it up again for, uh, for bringing it to the final size. So I've got most of the roughing done. You can see this land now. Uh, it runs the entire distance from here to here. That clearance is completely gone. And, uh, and so we're definitely going to have to replace that clearance behind the teeny tiny land that we're going to leave on there. So I'm where I wanted to end up here. I'm at uh, exactly 5 eighths of an inch uh, right at the cutting edge, the leading edge. And then around here, I'm smaller. So that's going to do it for this setup and this setup is going to work whether you have a spiral to your flutes or not uh, regardless of what kind of shank you have you might have a slightly different method of work holding uh, because of your different style of shank but basically this what we just did is going to work for all your straight reamers so now we have to tackle that uh, clearance angle behind the land we want the the land to be a small fraction of what it currently is here and so, of course, we're going to do the setup that it would take to do a slow right hand spiral. Uh, but we will discuss different setups that could be used, uh, let's say you had straight flutes or uh, um, straight flutes. Just straight flutes. Just straight flutes. Just straight flutes. <laughs> I've got this setup made now to create that clearance behind the land. And it's awfully tricky to see what's going on down in here. So I've drawn a little picture. I'm hoping will help explain. Um, if you imagine this is the grinding wheel and this is the spiral flute um, of the reamer and then this black lines is my little pointer that I'm going to follow along that spiral with. So if you notice, I've basically got the surface of the business end of this pointer parallel um, and it would be touching, but it was hard to draw like that. So parallel uh, to the spiral. That way, uh, as, I, as I come onto it and go across it, it's not going to do weird things on me. I hope I'm explaining this well enough. Also, you see I have an edge sticking out here. The reason for that is so that as I bring the leading edge of my tool up towards this thing, I can get it up touching the pointer well before uh, it hits the wheel because the last thing I want is the wheel grinding where I don't want to grind. So that's my explanation. I hope that's understandable. Now, if you get in here and look at this, hopefully you can see kind of what I'm talking about. So the end of my pointer finger here is basically touching more or less all the way across the face of that tooth. And so that pointer is going to rotate this tool um, as it you know, spirals along. Then when I come off the end of this tooth, I'm able to index to the next tooth, come on long before touching the wheel, come up and touch my pointer, and then make my cut and come across like that. So hopefully that illustrates it well enough. And this is by far the fiddliest part of, of doing this whole thing because uh, a lot has to go right and uh, it's really hard to see in there what's going on. 
but I think this will work for us and I think this demonstrates the point. So I'm just going to travel along slowly. I have my wheel running in reverse so that the tool pressure, the cutting pressure of the wheel is going to want to rotate the reamer up into my pointer so things can't get out of hand on me. So I've taken my first pass off this tooth and what I hope that you can see here is that we are now creating this clearance angle in behind the land and the land has gone from being the full width of this thing to just a small bit right here. So now I'm going to work my way all the way around this tool until I have all the teeth looking like that and actually that might be fine. We might just have to make the one lap around this thing. So that'll do it for that setup. I'm happy with the uh, width of that land. And if we get in here real close, we can see uh, our land right here, and then our clearance in behind it. And that should be just about right. This method would work on a straight flute, but it's a little overly complicated than it needs to be. Uh, basically, if you had a straight flute, you wouldn't need to follow it with your fingers. You could just, uh, you could have it held in, say, a sensitive work head and just index to your next tooth and in and out. Um, so we've definitely shown the most complicated example here. And there's a bunch of different ways you could accomplish it on different tools. We had to do it this way on this tool, but if you had a straight flute, you do have more options. Again, a sensitive work head uh, would, would be adequate. So that's it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, Dave will, uh, have at her, get those reamers uh, brought down to your metric size. And uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time. Please like, share, and subscribe. And if anybody wants to see anything, just let us know. How'd that work out? <laughs> Good, I'm just videoing your silly cat. <laughs>